Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you for coming to our meeting today, and I'd like to call the um, Health and Human Services meeting of May 8th, 2017, to order. Um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I was supposed to start that, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, does anyone have a motion to adopt the agenda? Moved by Carabelli, supported by Don, nope, sorry, Joe Romano. Um, we need a motion to approve, nope, not yet. Oh, all those in favor? Please vote on your iPads. Those opposed, don't vote. Do I have to vote in both places? No, it's usually that you want them both. Okay. Motion passes. Okay, oh, you just missed that. I didn't say, okay. All right. Um, we need a motion to approve the minutes dated April 10th, 2017. Motion uh, by Leonetti, seconded by Kraft. Please vote. No, I did vote. Mm -mm. Um, Agenda, agenda number five, public participation. If anybody would like to participate, you have five minutes to speak and um, on re issues related to the agenda. Any public participation? I see none, so we will move on to uh, agenda um, number six. We have a presentation by Martha T. Berry. Um, Kevin Evans, would you like to come up? Thank you. Understand. I'm sorry, so Kevin. You took you, you made you took Suri wanted to talk to you. <laughs> it was off, and Suri came on. Suri's got to go down here. I apologize. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. Uh, today, just a quick summary our first quarter census, otherwise known as our occupancy, is, is low, but it's expected in some ways. Uh, even though our census is low, our financial position has improved. We've had two audits, one from Ab Abraham and Gaffney, that's our uh, audit, uh, independent audit, and then our Medicaid audit. We asked for an expedited audit that included three years, and we've also begun a number of capital projects and assessments that we're we'll talking about. First, our census. Year to date, our uh, occupancy is at 92.7%, which is down from 2016 of 94.7%. Uh, 3%. This is still roughly 8% better than occupancy than the rest of the county and about 10% than the state. Uh, we are the provider of choice as the safety net in the community and that is the number one reason why our census tends to be higher than those in the area. Some of the factors that are depressing um, our census right now uh, is a number of uh, uh, facilities have been built that are brand new assisted living facilities. Uh, our legacy reputation is a one-star facility. We also have some pilot projects that preclude us from working with them, uh, the insurance carriers, uh, unless you're a three-star. Uh, I'm excited uh, about what's happening with our, our quality ratings. As we had talked uh, prior, uh, our, our one-star, we had talked about the earliest we could impact that would be third quarter this year. Uh, in 20, uh, uh, 2015, uh, we had 18 citations. 2014, there were 27 citations. So uh, last year, uh, I'm pleased to say we were at 11 citations. And uh, this time last year, uh, we, had, uh, we had already had three citations, one of which was a G-level citation. But so far this year, we are citation free. We've had over 20 facility report incidents. Those are things that the state requires us to report, and they have found um, no deficiencies. Uh, so our quality is going in the right direction. Despite our depressed occupancy, our financial position has improved. Uh, 
in the first quarter, we launched our electronic medical record system, and we knew that our costs would be higher, so we lost a little bit of money from what we expected to. Uh, we are, however, back to managing our, our, our labor based on census. Our cash position has improved, um, uh, and uh, even though we have our Medicaid audit has come in with some, uh, some negative numbers, we're still gonna be in a pretty good position. Now, for those of you that are, are new to long-term care, uh, I had mentioned the audit from the Medicaid system. Uh, each year, uh, we send a cost report in uh, on all of our expenses. There are certain expenses that the state deems allowable and certain expenses that say are non-allowable. Among those, there are some that are in dispute and depending on how the audit looks at it, they can choose to take some money back or not. The majority of the money that came back were, uh, were based on census days and uh, on about $60 million, we're looking at about $300,000 that, that, that they're taking back from us. We'll have the final number next week, and I'll present that in the second quarter. But uh, we have additional money that has come in through what is called certified public expenditure uh, that'll easily cover that amount. So we will not be going into the hole based on that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. What I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about is our actual finance position. We are, uh, we are managed differently than a department that has an allocated budget. We are, are focused on an enterprise system, and this is something that is important for us to note because our revenues and our expenses uh, do fluctuate based upon our census. So if we have more people coming in than expected, we will have more expenses. Now, that is different than a normal department budget that has an allocation uh, that, that requires you to come and get more money to be able to provide more services and vice versa. Um, what you have in front of you, and it's a little bit difficult to see, so I'll blow up some of the sections, and I've, I've numbered them just for our, our ability to talk about it, is an excerpt from three pages uh, of the monthly uh, uh, income statement that our board receives. Now, what we look at doing is having our operations have enough money to provide that year's uh, capital budget so that we end up with a zero-based budget. This was something that I was told by, um, uh, by the finance department and by the previous uh, board chair that this commission likes to see. So I'll show that to you right now. Um, also, uh, as we talked last year, when special monies come in, that should not be considered part of the budget but set aside and I, I believe, Mr. Carabella, you had asked us to do that last year, and you'll see that this is how it's represented here when we get to it. Uh, first is the, uh, uh, you'll see the net income. That right there is, on the right-hand side, is our budget. We expected to make $180,000 in the first quarter, and you see we only, we only were able to have a, a positive $161,000. Now, if you take a look at where our capital projects are at, you take that same $180,000 budget, which is on the right-hand side, and that's the money that we expected to spend out of this year's budget. You know, you'll see here we spend a little bit more on that. And we do that for two reasons. One, we have a need. Second, we have money set in our, already in our cash account that was set aside for that. Um, for some of the, the uh, commissioners that have been here, we received about, uh, what was it, about $860,000, maybe Steve can remember, that was left from money that is designated for capital. I don't have a way right now to represent that money set aside here in this. I'm going to be actually talking with Plant Moran as a way to be able to represent that. So for right now, just know that we have additional money set inside specifically to help with the building. But as you see on item two, we spend a little bit more on capital projects. Item three is our certified public expenditure. You'll see that we received $869,060, but we did not budget for that and we did that with intention. Our, our goal and our responsibility is to have a sustainable model at Martha T. Berry that is independent of any external money coming in. With that in mind, the CPE is a short-term uh, revenue stream based on uh, a couple of years ago, finance department working on refinancing our OPEB. So uh, with that in mind, we, we're getting some of that money back from the federal government. That is something that is, um, that 
is part of the federal reimbursement program under Medicare and Medicaid. We set that aside so that we can see that it's there, but we don't budget for it because we don't want uh, to presume that it's gonna be there forever. As a matter of fact, in 2022, uh, uh, federal rule says that it will be sunset. So we are not acting as if it's there from a budget standpoint. However, we have about $3 million that we know that we need to improve on over the next couple of years in capital. And it's our hope to use a portion of that uh, as it comes in to help uh, focus on the building and provide for the building and also shore up our cash position. Now, I believe uh, that the report that you received on first quarter showed that we had a loss of about $26,000. Uh, and, and if you take a look at the capital projects being 7,000 over and our operations being 19,000 under, that's the $26,000 difference as you see there. But you can also see that we received that 869,000 that nets us in a positive position. So we're in pretty good shape financially. And I believe um, last year, uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld asked, how long will it take to get us out of a negative net position? This is something else that is different in an enterprise fund versus uh, an allocated budget. We're required to, sh to represent our long-term liability on our bottom line. Uh, audited our net position a, as of 2015 was a negative 11 million. And that is that long-term liability that says, if we had to close today, we, we would be 11 million short. Uh, I'm pleased to say that unaudited, we're still headed in the right direction. As you can see on item four, even this year, our year-to-date net position continues to head in the correct uh, direction. Now, recognize that those numbers are getting smaller because a negative big number is worse, all right? So we're hoping to turn that uh, in the next several years over into a positive. Uh, my hope is every year we're looking at knocking at least a half a million off of that negative net position. As you know, it's a difficult balance because we have a need of, uh, of improving our physical plant. The competition is quite rich uh, in the area with new buildings going up and remodels happening. So we have to balance the need to, to make sure that we have a sustainable, mo sustainable model while at the same time improving the physical structure so that it's appealing to people coming in. We've begun working with uh, Lynn over at Facilities and Operations and, and I do want to uh, formally say thank you to her. Uh, she helped in many ways uh, to get us, uh, give us direction as to uh, some vendors that the county was using that was already vetted through the purchasing process so we could access uh, the, uh, the contracts that are already being used to the county without having to the expense of rebidding. Uh, also, she was incredibly helpful in, in us getting our request for qualifications for an architect for our kitchen and dining room renovation. So the current projects that we are working on is uh, we're getting the, ge the uh, generator engineering study. It is uh, uh, the second month underway. Th that is uh, converting two generators that are 50 years old into one uh, gas or hybrid generator that will handle the full facility. Uh, we're also going to be coordinating with FNO on that because they're going to be putting new infrastructure in, the power lines going underground both to us and to, um, to the jail. And if, if we coordinate that, we can save some construction costs together. Our door access control, uh, we're able to uh, access, no pun intended, the, um, the county commissioners uh, or the county's uh, uh, contracts on that to allow us to get door access control at a very good rate uh, uh, on the county bids. Our call light system, as I had mentioned in previous meetings, uh, is over 17 years old and we are uh, going to be, we just received approval from our board uh, to replace that. And then lastly, our kitchen and dining RFQ. Uh, we were able to get the, the, uh, the RFQ on Mitten and uh, we had 40 uh, vendors look at it. We had walkthroughs on 13 different organizations and uh, we will be getting their bids uh, next week and we'll begin opening and evaluating those. Lynn also agreed to give us some overview and help on that as well. That's all I have. Do you have any questions? To add? Or any questions? No? Okay. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. Thank um, you. Do we have a motion to receive and file? By Majek and seconded by Jordan. Jordan, Jordan. Please vote. Okay, it's unanimous. Um, good. <laughs> Uh, agenda, agenda item 6B, um, we have Rhonda Powell here for Macomb Community Action Department Overview. Do we have a motion to receive and file? From Don Brown and from Jolette. Thank you. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's give a minute for the dream team to assemble up here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the invitation and um, the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, our passion, which is Macomb Community Action. And um, to share, I, I know some of you may have uh, may be familiar with Macomb Community Action, but it's great to present it again as we have done, uh, uh, just grown by leaps and bounds and um, been doing a lot of great work over the past couple years, so. And I'm not biased at all. <laughs> Next. That didn't work. <laughs> Next. Oh, okay, see? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so um, in this slide, um, I wanted to just share um, the, about the uh, current um, operations. Macomb Community Action, as many of you will um, know, is um, our, has been our name over the past um, two years now. We changed the name on the heels of uh, a pretty expansive strategic planning process that um, we embarked upon and really it was a great project because the team really took it on and um, we took volunteers and victims from all across the agency and um, took an opportunity to um, really look at what we do and how we do it. So currently, um, okay, um, 1964 is when the agency was in initially established in Macomb County and today we have three divisions, community services, the Office of Senior Services, Children and Family Services, um, which is something new as well. Our budget is approximately 41 million. And um, as demonstrated on the slide, um, a huge chunk of what we do is um, supported by federal dollars. Um, and um, we also appreciate the continued support we receive from this body as well. Currently, we have 294 staff members, but at full capacity, we're about 320 staff. So we um, have some um, we have some vacancies right now, and um, positions that came out of the current budget process as well. And then we just added a little piece there to show um, just exactly how that budget breaks down. Um, we're very proud of the fact. Um, I'll put a plug in for Gary, who's here, uh, yeah. that we keep our administrative cost under the allowed 10%. So we um, make an effort to do that. Or Okay, now I can work. Next. I just tapped it again. Should I say help me, Mike, or <laughs> some magic words? <laughs> All right. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, this is just a brief snapshot of our current uh, organizational chart. Um, and we look forward to even having that evolve, but some of the work that we're doing, we wanna use more of a Venn diagram in the future to show how programs are related. Um, divisions can kind of speak to silos, so we, we really wanna get away from even those terms. So we are a work in progress. 
And just a little bit more, um, like I mentioned about the strategic plan that uh, we went, uh, we had in 2015, it really was championed internally. Um, we really are fortunate to have a great deal of subject matter experts across our divisions and throughout the agency. And um, we pulled together to kind of do an in-depth analysis of, you know, what have we done over the years and what has that gotten us? Um, the funders have changed their expectations and um, certainly the needs in the community have changed dramatically. So we really want to challenge ourselves to make sure we're using our resources to adequately meet those needs in the most efficient way possible. We, uh, as I mentioned, we changed our name. It was formerly McKessa. And um, out of that came um, three strategic goals, uh, organizational development, uh, diminish poverty and promote independence. And that's those areas are really the lens through which we look at everything. So the potential for new programs that um, we have opportunities for, does it do one of these things? So. And our mission, we changed the mission, persistent action to diminish poverty and promote independence. We're very proud of that mission. Um, I do quizzes every once in a while to make sure people can recite it. <laughs> but um, it says a lot about what we do and, and we want to be very intentional and deliberate about um, providing a service that um, holds us accountable, holds the people we serve accountable, and um, you know provides impact. We really are shifting our efforts to um, to promote collective impact. So it's not just what we do, but it's the partners that we work with. We, you know, we can't be all things to all people. But what we can do is use our position in the community to convene the right groups. There are gaps in service, but we don't need to provide them all. We can be a tool in helping to make sure that they exist and are uh, resources available for Macomb County residents, many uh, of which are our most vulnerable. That's an area we, we truly pride ourselves on. Um, so, and then we have our list of values as well. Our people, diversity and inclusion, customer-centered services, accessibility, equity, and parity. And some of that you see through the lens of our uh, family resource centers that we have, um, where we provide services and, and co-locate uh, some of our nonprofit partners to do the work and to address the accessibility issue as well. In Macomb County, transportation has been a huge ongoing issue. So the way that we position ourselves to provide service is important. And of course, uh, advocacy. You can't do this kind of work without advocating for the people that um, depend on you. So I'm gonna call up uh, Joe Cook, who is the division director for our community services division. And Joe has been with Community Action for 17 years? 16, I, I gave him an extra year. <laughs> Joe Cook. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, I'd like to briefly just go over um, a few of the programs that fall under the uh, community service uh, uh, category. Uh, the first is our chore program, and Mac uh, Macomb Community Action's chore service assists senior citizens with home maintenance, uh, such as grass cutting during the warm months and snow removal during the winter months. The program is available to persons age 60 and older and who are uh, uh, residents of targeted areas of the county. These services allow seniors to stay in their homes and maintain a feeling of independence. Another is our home injury control, or HIC program. Uh, this program uh, is to prevent injuries in the homes of disabled or um, frail seniors who may not otherwise be able to afford uh, such devices. Uh, this is a one-time service provided to seniors over 60. It includes the installation of devices such as grab bars, transfer benches, handheld shower heads, and toilet assist rails. These services are targeted to create a sense of bathroom safety and prevent falls. When available, uh, seniors are also eligible for temporary aluminum ramps when those are available. Another one of our programs is the transportation program. Our agency program provides transportation services to essential medical appointments for qualified county residents. We offer a fleet of vehicles and include some vehicles equipped with hydraulic wheelchair lifts. 
The program also provides coordinated services with other agency programs, such as Meals on Wheels and our Adult Day Service. And we also partner with various community partners, such as MCHAT, Michigan Works, and the Circuit Court. Another program is our weatherization program. This program performs the installation of various energy efficient measures designed to conserve energy and reduce utility expenses in residents' homes. These improvements can reduce energy use and save residents an average of 30% on heat and utility bills. These measures can include wall and attic insulation, air leakage, re leakage reduction, furnace repair and replacement. Uh, and last fiscal year, we uh, weatherized uh, 146 homes in the county. And lastly, for Community Services Division is community development. Uh, these programs focus on programs that are funded through HUD and include the Community Development Block Grant Program, the Home Program, and the Emergency Solutions Grant. The county's program services 21 local municipalities, not including the communities that receive their funding directly from HUD, and those would be Sterling Heights, Warren, Clinton Township, Roseville, and St. Clair Shores. These funds may be used for a uh, range of activities, but must all benefit low and moderate income individuals. Each community receives an allocation based on population and need. Communities then select projects based on local input from their residents. Eligible projects include improvements to senior citizen centers, water and sewer upgrades, park improvements, as well as street and sidewalk programs. The programs also provide funding for targeted home rehabilitation projects around the county. And I'd like to bring up now my colleague, uh, Christy King. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, just, a, just to kind of um, provoke thought as the PowerPoint, as the presentation is going along, um, some of these programs that we have, you'll hear across the agency, um, complement one another, like CHORE and the historical community development programs like home rehab and that. And we've really made an effort to kind of use those together where in the past they were used more um, separately and we did separate intakes even for them, but those are some of the areas that we've consolidated. So our next, and we'll take any question. Did you want a question now or did you want to wait till we were all finished? <laughs> We thought it might be easier while the person's okay. up speaking, we okay. could ask we'll questions. So does too. anyone have any questions for Joe? Looks, it looks as if Leon is up. Well, I was going to wait till the end. You prefer to wait till the end? Okay. Bob? Thank you. Jed, just, uh, that's a oh, I'm laughing. sorry. <laughs> wait. Um, weatherization, I'm just curious. The Joe? stimulus package from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's Bob. Uh, from what I recall, weatherization was uh, a position that we were able to add one or two because of that. We did. Um, due to the uh, era, era, um, we were able to really ramp up the weatherization program. We received a, quite a bit of um, federal dollars under okay. the stimulus program. Uh, we purchased a lot of vehicles. We were able to hire a lot of staff, and uh, we weatherized probably... 2,400, 500 homes during that time. Okay. Um, unfortunately, what goes up sometimes comes down, and as quickly as we were able to build it up, we had to, to downsize when those dollars went away. How long ago was, uh, how long did that program last? Uh, it was 2009 Optimus. through 2012. So three years, the federal three, government three to four, gave yeah. more money, and now Correct. it went back down. It went back down to pre-existing uh, pre uh, okay. uh, amounts. And my question that maybe all of you don't have to answer now, but just looking here that the fe uh, your budget's 41 million, 56% from the federal government. Obviously, you're always looking at that over time if you're increasing it or decreasing it. And um, what's the word out there that uh, you guys worried that you're, you're gonna be cut? Uh, and well, anything concrete and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, fortunately, you, a lot of uh, our, our programs enjoy a lot of bipartisan support in, in Congress, and, and we've had some, some very good allies on both sides of the aisle. Um, to be honest with you, the budget that was proposed uh, a couple of months ago would, would gut some of these programs, um, but we're, we're confident going into these budget negotiations that we have enough support on both sides of the aisle that we won't see, hopefully, uh, a lot of significant cuts to these programs. La last question, Madam Chair. Um, so how much would that equate to the proposal to, to cut some of your department? Uh, any idea in terms of percentage or numbers here? It, Gary might be able to, uh, I mean, it would be I mean, devastating. That's a lot of money. You're, you're, yeah. You have a big department yeah. in the federal government. That's a lot of money. So yeah. we have to be prepared. Right, a lot of these if programs. If that happens, what are we going to do? That's yeah. yeah, a lot of these programs would cease to exist. So thank you. Yep. Ron has got some. Yeah, and one of the things that um, we've done is um, 
look at creating an essential operations plan um, because we have to have measures in place to um, to understand how to, first of all, if there is a shutdown, and a federal government shutdown, that affects us as well. Um, so making sure that we have some measures in place, and we're already, it's one of the reasons why we need to look at how these programs are coordinated with other existing funding sources. So programs that uh, have different, come from different pots of money that might be supported through uh, some CDFIs that um, invest in local programs for community development. We are looking at all those different measures to try to diversify the funds that come in. You're welcome. Is there anyone? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Smith, you Thanks. have a um, question for Ms. Mr. Fokker for Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, kind of piggybacking on what Rob said, I th we're, we're seeing this in uh, the area agency on aging, we're seeing it in the uh, community mental health, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously you do have to at least be concerned that something like this might happen to your department, and I, I would really, I, I know you guys, you just gave a little explanation of what you're doing, but I'd really like to you know, here at least maybe you know down the line mm -hmm. on what we're doing on the just in case side yeah. of things, right? Mm -hmm. Because you always have to anticipate yeah. that the worst is going to happen. This is what we would do, or this is kind of how we're mm -hmm. seeing this happen in the future. I just mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, have mm -hmm. seen, I, I, and I don't expect that you are going to right. do this, but I've seen it where it almost seemed like someone they put their their heads in the sand kind of and just said, well, it's not going to affect us, and right. I just. Um, would would love to hear your guys uh, mm -hmm. plan I don't need to hear it right, right. now but I and we can certainly share that um, like I said one of the things we put in place I already had the Debbie Downer conversation with our leadership team but we do unfortunately have to think that way mm -hmm. and we have to understand what a worst case scenario what that impact would look like and we're still really going through that process to see because it not affects only us uh, community action but what are the other impacts <coughs> across the county mm -hmm. that, you know, and how should we be working together to make sure we're not, you know, right. duplicating efforts where we could be more impactful working together. Great. And one of the things that the commissioners, uh, some of us more than others, Commissioner Carabelli, which is good, we always look at <laughs> how to combine and, and work together. And mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned that, Joe, that you guys do a lot of, you know, cross, uh, and one of them you said was transportation. Mm -hmm. I always think that veterans has uh, an issue with, uh, transportation I'm just wondering do you guys cross the line over with them too to help I mean I imagine you we know, do we will, we will uh, work with Laura Rios um, when she has um, cases arise where um, she needs transportation for some of her veterans and we work with the circuit court on the jury shuttle and Michigan works on getting people to some of their mm -hmm. things so mm -hmm. and M chap yeah perfect thank you mm -hmm. Thanks. Right there. Commissioner Drillat Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple questions for the gentleman with community mm -hmm. services uh, the weatherization program uh, how much uh, on average, is it per project? You said it was about 146 projects or so. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea what that is, what the average expenditure is per project that we help with? Typically, the average per job cost that we are allowed is about $6,400. 6400 Yeah, typically, um, we don't get that high. Right. Um, in years past, back in the, the 80s and early 90s, when we were doing fallout window replacements and things like that. We found that those type of measures were eating up a lot of that budget. Um, so we try and uh, um, stay away from the bigger items like that. And over the years, the Department of Energy has eliminated some of those measures. So we typically don't get close to that $6,400 amount, and that allows us to weatherize more homes and have a bigger impact. Is, is it a means-tested program? And what is, a, what is a threshold for someone to uh, get some help with that type of a program? It's based on income. Uh, a family um, uh, can apply through one of our community action centers, and uh, they provide uh, their income information, um, home information, whether they're renters or they own the home. Uh, we work with them on that, and then we go out and do a full energy inspection on the home. We run diagnostic testing to see what we can do to tighten up the home, uh, ensuring that we don't over-tighten the home and make it unsafe by being too tight. Mm -hmm. uh, we have contractors that are uh, vetted through the county through purchasing. Uh, they go in and do the work, and then we go back and run those diagnostic tests again to make sure everything is as it should be. Okay, and just last question on this, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. What percentage of folks that uh, request help with this program are you able to help? Is it, uh, you, you know, 20%, 50%, 90%? 
of those who want help with that particular program, how many can you actually help? Very rarely do we turn anyone away from, and it would have to be an instance where uh, there's no um, heat or electricity in the home or uh, something like that, big gaping holes in the uh, roof that need to be addressed before we could weatherize the home. Typically, we're, we're far into the 90s uh, as far as percentage of people we're able to help that seek help for the program. And what, what happened after the federal stimulus package money ended? Uh, it sounds like you're helping a lot more folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, do they not re request how, how did you find more folks to help if you're already serving 90 percent? Well for many years uh, many years we ran waiting lists that were, were months and months long just to get an inspection. Uh, the stimulus package helped us catch up on that. Um, we typically don't advertise the program because we have an adequate number of uh, uh, people who apply for it and one thing about that program is once you're weatherized we can't weatherize your home again. So there are a full stock of homes in the county that have been weatherized over the years that we'd like to go back because they haven't been done since I think the cutoff date now is 1993. Anyone prior to that, we can re-weatherize again, but anyone after 1993, we can't go back, unfortunately. Gotcha. Thank you. It was very helpful. You're Thank welcome. You, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Leonetti? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess this question for Ms. Powell. Um, hi. Um, Rhonda, please. Oh, okay, Rhonda, no problem. You can call me Rob, too. Um, <laughs> oftentimes in uh, my other career as an attorney, I, um, I represent some property management companies, and oftentimes I'm uh, on the side of evicting people uh, who aren't paying their rent. And uh, oftentimes those folks, once they get, once they get a judgment, uh, go to Macomb Community Action mm -hmm. and uh, work a way to try to come up with the funds in a certain amount of time. What percentage do you think in your department uh, do you have on those kind of situations, just out of curiosity? I don't know that we track that separately, okay. um, but I know that Linda is going to talk a little bit about the um, what we do in our action centers, um, but we that's another area that where we coordinate that because rarely is one organization um, is there one organization that's paying the entire balance? That's because true. Because it's usually a cumulative yeah. balance. And so we work with um, DHHS, uh, maybe one of the, um, like Salvation Army, uh, one of the churches to help um, St. Vincent de Paul to kind of, and then usually the uh, customer has a percentage to come up that's with right. as well. So um, the percentage that are specific to evictions, I'm not sure, okay. but I can certainly check and let uh, you know. You know, you, you did bring up something that I noticed, and, and I think you stated in your opening statement, that I found Mac Macomb Community Action was very uh, aggressive in getting these other organizations, St. Vincent de Paul, a church, um, other groups to come in and help out with the tenant. And mm -hmm. so, you know, part of my questions is also a compliment to you, because many times I've, I've seen it where, uh, you know, we thought the person was gonna be evicted, and because of Macomb Community Action and their efforts in getting, it's not their money, it's not the county's money, okay. it's not the federal government's money, it's actually charitable groups mm -hmm. that often come forward and help to keep the tenant there. And so I, I do like your persistent action to diminish poverty <laughs> and promote independence. I, I've seen your persistence, so thank, thank you. you. Thank mm -hmm. you, we, we take pride in that and that's why I call them the dream team. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, Anyone thank you. Um, Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to go back, uh, Commissioner uh, Drolet mentioned uh, some questions about the weatherization, and I have a few more ab uh, about that, and then the home rehabilitation. <laughs> when, when you brought up that the home is inspected before and after, mm -hmm. that's an independent inspector, correct? No, that is a county employee. So when a county employee goes out and they're doing the, the uh, reading of uh, the windows if it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It's an accounting, county employee that's going out there and doing, doing the inspections before and after. Correct. And that's covered in the administrative cost? Yes. That's the administrative cost of it. Then the next question is, is these contractors, mm -hmm. the current contractors that are working, how long have they been working directly for the county? I would say one of the three main ones has probably been with us for 25 years, um, two, of the remaining uh, two of the three probably came on right about the time we ramped up with ERA and have been with us since then, so probably 2008 or so. Okay, so all three contractors have been with the county for quite a period of time, and mm -hmm. it's an average of $6,400 per home, is that what you said? That we're allowed, yes. Okay. And, and, and what was the overall budget for that? Uh, again, I apologize. Uh, for the current fiscal year that we are in, 
uh, for the weatherization program as the Department of Energy portion of it was 653,000 and then another portion that comes out of the LIHEAP block grant was 278,000 so under under a million under a million dollars thank you and so my question is is that these contractors have been with us for quite a long time um, and it's just under a million dollars worth of work and out of the three contractors, is this work divided up equally into thirds, or is this work divided up? One's getting 50%, and one's the other two are split in 25%. Is there a certain mixture on this? One of the things we do when we do an RFQ is gauge capacity. Um, some contractors are bigger than others. We have a scoring system that we use. Um, contractors have a certain amount of time that they have to turn jobs back in. If they're not meeting those benchmarks, then work is reallocated to other contractors because we don't feel it's fair to subject the uh, customers to, to long waits and that type of thing. So within your three contractors you had for the last few years, you taking work from them and giving it to one of the other contractors, or has it all been running pretty smoothly? Very rarely do we have to, have we had issues with contractors? I think it's because of the, the relationships we've had with them over the years, and um, they know how the system works. And when we do these RFQs, it's a very small fraternity of contractors that actually bid on these work, and outside of the three that normally do it, there's usually not any others typically that put in for the work. So uh, RF Q, not an RFP? Well, we do RFQs and RFPs. And this isn't per individual, this is per the calendar year, or how is that done? We do it um, biannually on the fiscal year. Our, our program year for this program runs July 1st through June 30th. So you're doing it for that fiscal year, you're going back out and typically only the three contractors that's been doing it for quite a few years are the only ones that are really doing it? Typically, yes. We advertise it, we put it on mitten, we go through purchasing, we do all of that. Um, during the era, uh, the time, there was a bit more contractors that did it. And uh, um, as the work started to fall off when the, the funding did, um, so did some of the contractors. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, do we... Um, we'll have the motion received. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, You're right. Yes. I'm so sorry. We have Christy King. Yes. Um, so Christy King has been with us for seven months. Mm -hmm. And um, she we threw her in like we do everyone. <laughs> 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 but she has hit the ground running, and we're very uh, proud of um, what she is accomplishing um, with our seniors. And um, so she will present some of the up-and-coming things with seniors. Good afternoon. So primarily under our Office of Senior Services is our Meals on Wheels program, of course. Um, our largest portion of what we do under seniors are our senior nutrition. And so with that, oh, how about I change the slide? <laughs> I'm reading, you guys didn't know that. Uh, so under Meals on Wheels, we serve about 1,700 meals a day. We deliver about 1,700 with our network of volunteers, about 1,000 volunteers um, in our entire network, including some transportation drivers as well. Um, so we serve about 1,700 meals a day. Um, we are one of the largest chapters here in Michigan. We're proud to say that, so we work pretty hard. In addition to that, we also have our dining senior style, so that's our congregate meals, um, where our seniors come together at about 22 sites throughout the county and have a meal together. Um, and we serve about three to 400 meals a day on that, give or take. So daily, about 1,900, 2,000 meals a day we have going out for our older adults. So our adult day services, our wonderful program over at the Verculin building, we do welcome you guys to come out and visit. It is a fun day. Um, and so that is our partnership with Martha T. Berry that we're very, very proud of. And it combines the social and medical model together. So it allows us to provide some of that medical care for some of our seniors to come in. Priority is given to those with dementia and Alzheimer's, so it's a very, very structured environment for them. Activities, we provide the meals, which the meals go through our Meals on Wheels program, um, and everything is supervised, all the activities, they're engaged um, daily. Transportation is provided for some, um, and family members will drop off others that may need the services through the day. So we have about 15 we serve on a daily basis, average give and take, just depending on what the need is. and our resource advocates. So those are our specialists that actually go out into the homes and meet with seniors um, that may not be able to go out on their own. And so we provide a lot of in-home um, assessments, assessments for our Meals on Wheels, assessments for other programs, um, affordable, uh, affordable Care Act, tax credits to make sure they're getting their heating credits, um, Medicare, Medicaid assistance, when Medicare Part D time comes up in October-ish, we have appointments where they can come in and or we go into the homes and service them themselves. Um, in addition to connecting them with different partners that we've talked about already throughout the county itself. 
And last but not least is our evidence-based program. So we do have some programs that we actually offer in the community, throughout the community. One is our falls prevention program, which is Matter of Balance. That's an eight-week program where um, caregivers or senior itself can actually come in and learn some techniques and activities around fall prevention. We know that's a huge thing, and seniors that fall, often we know that sometimes it's not a good outcome. Um, and so we there it's very it's a it's a interactive kind of sessions where they actually interact with two facilitators um, do some exercise in addition to some ongoing book work and then it's our path personal action towards health that's a program that's also offered throughout the state um, and actually through the throughout the country is actually called chronic disease self-management so it's a program offered through Stanford we offer this workshop it's a six-week workshop and it works on empowering people to take an active role in managing their chronic condition whatever their health care issue may be and that's again for caregivers or for the senior itself that wants to take an active role in managing their health and what that looks like and any questions No, <laughs> sure that's not it. Okay. Commissioners, are there any new questions? Madam Chair, I just want to thank you and the staff for taking Mathis. time a few weeks ago to meet with me uh, to learn more about uh, Meals on Wheels. Thanks. We thank you. We invite anyone to come out and have conversations with myself or our staff. We invite you guys to come out, pick up a route, volunteer. Um, about an hour out of your day. It's a lot of fun to connect with the seniors and kind of see what's going on and kind of visit what we do over at the Burke Building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. So our last presenter um, is gonna be Linda Azar, who is a familiar face. There's, she um, has been the face of our um, nonprofit arm, the Macomb Food Program. And I thought it was important for you to see the faces that um, represent these programs. And um, often it's not known that uh, the food program is our nonprofit arm. So there are, we have staff that help to support that. And Linda is our primary champion. Also noteworthy is that Linda is now a division director with Macomb Community Action. And she was formerly a program manager, but she's just that phenomenal. So <laughs> <laughs> Linda. <laughs> Good afternoon. So I'm gonna start with speaking a little bit about our community action centers under the new Children and Family Services um, Department. We now have um, the community action centers which fall under two family resource centers, both in repurposed vacant school buildings, one of which is at, uh, the Max Thompson Family Resource Center in Warren, and the other being the Macomb County Family Resource Center in Mount Clemens. We also have satellite centers located in New Haven and Romeo. Our family resource center centers assist with um, eligible customers with utility shutoffs, rent and mortgage assistance. We also recently um, opened with a partnership with the Macomb Food Program, a client choice pantry, and it really lends itself to a grocery style source store setting where people um, basically get the, um, the opportunity to shop for foods that their families actually will consume as opposed to us forcing food upon them, which is very typical of the food pantry setting. So we're really proud of that model. Um, we also accept, we also distribute commodities and focus hope out of that site, which is um, really beneficial because it helps us really stretch the amount of food that families are getting because we receive the food from the USDA to distribute through commodities, whereas the emergency food side is more difficult to maintain because we have to raise funds and do food drives and things of that nature to be able to sustain that part of the distribution. We also um, obviously partner with lots of different organizations in both of those buildings to make it really truly a, um, a resource for, for the community, some of which we have in our centers are the Good Shepherd Coalition, the Macomb Homeless Coalition, the Community Housing Network, and also a partnership with Detroit Arsenal for some youth programming. Next near and dear to my heart is the Macomb Food Program, and as Rhonda mentioned, that is our nonprofit arm, our 501c3, which is governed by a board that I work with very closely to ensure that we continue to uh, be able to support over 50 pantries throughout Macomb County. We're very unique in that as a food bank, which in essence, that's what we are, um, we do not charge any of our community partners that we support with food on a bi-monthly basis for any of the food that they receive, which is very unique. Um, I purchase most of the food that 
that um, we are able to um, buy through Gleaners Community Food Bank. We also, within the last few years, partnered with um, Forgotten Harvest, and they are strictly recovery. And what we were finding is they were recovering food in Macomb County, but it didn't always stay in Macomb County. So we met with the team, and we decided that we would take on the recoveries of places like Vino Salvaggio and Kroger and some of the other local grocers. We recover that food directly, and then we take it to low-income senior housing sites and other um, distribution in our mobile-type setting. We distributed over 3 million pounds of food to over 220,000 individuals in 2016. That includes commodities, focused hope, and emergency food. We also, if anyone was able to catch the uh, Channel 4 News yesterday, they introduced our new Mobile Fresh, which was an initiative that we were able to um, have basically a grocery store on wheels. And the intention is that we get more healthy foods out into the community, really targeting our seniors and our children, who oftentimes are not getting the healthiest food options, especially in the pantry distribution setting. And last but certainly not least, our Children and Family Services has the Head Start programming, early childhood development, and education for ed eligible pregnant women and families with um, children zero to age five. We served in Head Start 842 children in 2016, and Early Head Start and our Child Care Partnership served over 180 children. This is comprehensive support services for children and families with evidence-based curriculum, wellness services, and individualized education support. We have partnerships with 19 school districts, and we recently added in 1516 East Detroit. Our classrooms are located everywhere from school buildings, early childhood centers, churches, and in-home child care providers. And that's all that I have. Any questions? For are these new or old questions? Bob, do you have a recent question? Okay, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, coming here today. I, I, all of your programs are so worthwhile. Uh, I, I think any of you who have not been uh, out on a Meals on Wheels uh, run or read at a Head Start program, uh, before you have anything to say about these programs, good or bad, you need to go out there and do that. I mean, the, mm -hmm. sitting there talking with the teachers at the Head Start program about these kids and what they um, what they don't have at home and uh, what they get out of this it, it's 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 just I mean it's it's commendable you know to say the least um, so that being said I do have kind of an interesting question for you that I just don't know if the, the, if you're required to weigh the food or not how do you come up with three million pounds of food so we most of the food that we get from the USDA <laughs> is already pre-weighed so when we invoice most of it does have poundage to it oh so right. when I buy um, from gleaners for example I could spend an upwards of ten thousand dollars to do one pantry distribution day mm -hmm. it actually comes with weights on it oh okay mm -hmm. just sounded uh, yes it does it weight. absolutely does and we also have a large scale <laughs> that probably could accommodate seven of us on top of it it's okay. a large scale that can yeah. accommodate totes so for the letter carrier's food drive, mm -hmm. we can actually weigh the food that's um, donated by the, by the public. <laughs> Thanks. So we do weigh it. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, but don't forget to leave food <laughs> out this coming. Yes, this Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Will they be coming to the homes on Saturday? Yes, yeah, so we partner with the letter carriers, and they will distribute bags and or postcards to your home, and then you can leave them by your mailbox or your porch, and then volunteers along with the letter carriers pick up that food and take it back to the post offices, and then we have partnered with the Teamsters who actually, in semis, bring the food all back to the warehouse on Saturday, and then we unload it, and we start boxing it through volunteers to get back out into the community. Fantastic, thank you. Do we have that? We're gonna ha we're gonna put that on our website. Okay, thank you. So that it gets some more help. Um, a few more people will see it. Uh, Commissioner Drovet. Thank you, Madam Chair. You, you weigh all that food. Sounds like a large scale operation. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, a couple questions for Ms. Powell. Uh, just you, on the first slide, you showed that about 25% of the overall budget uh, comes from other sources, which is the, the second biggest uh, source. What are examples of other sources? So um, we have more and more dollars that we receive from foundations because we, um, like I mentioned, are doing a much better job of trying to diversify the um, funds that come into the agency from non-government sources. Um, we also um, included in there is our in-kind 
contribution. And um, because so much of what we do is volunteer driven, so that is part of it as well. And um, Gary, if you have a little more mission from the. Hello, I'm Gary Cutler. I'm the fiscal person for Macomb Community Action. Roughly $7 million of that $12 million is, is in kind. Um, $5 million of that comes through the, the food program between uh, the commodities so and- in, in kind, uh, someone donated their services or- do, uh, Okay. Well, there, it can be a combination of, ser of services or actual products. Okay. So, for example, the food would be the letter carrier's food drive. Again, we weigh that food, we put a value to it, we record it on our books as that. We also, a lot of our programs have cost share in them, where, um, for example, the Meals on Wheels, those people make a voluntary donation to pay for part of their meals, so that would be included in those other sources. Uh, but the, the major one is, is the donated. Um, I also record donated uh, s volunteer time. In our Head Start program, we're required to have a almost $2 million of, of non-federal funds, which comes in matches. Um, when Bob mentioned um, people reading in the classroom, we, um, we have, when someone sits on our board, uh, advisory board, some of that time goes in, uh, is valued at, uh, mm -hmm. um, for our executive board would be valued at Rhonda's pay. For our um, policy council, again, because they're decision makers, we value them at program manager's pay. So a lot of a lot of it is in kind and, and the outside sources, as Rhonda mentioned, we have foundations, et cetera, that aren't under state, federal, or county funds. Yeah. As an example, one of for the first time we are recipients of funding from United Way. Um, where and it's because of some of the changes we've made in our programs. Usually uh, we were not able to apply for United Way uh, dollars because we're attached to county government. But I think we've made enough um, they are, have shifted to more of a com view of community impact and recognize some of the changes we've made. So we absolutely now are funding, receive funding from those sources. Thank you. That answers my question. Just a, one last quick, uh, mm -hmm. well, one last question. Uh, you had uh, uh, displayed for us the street strategic goals of diminishing poverty, financial stability, and educational equity. How do you measure whether or not you're achieving those goals? Um, we Joseph will probably bore you for a long time about our Roma goals, uh, <laughs> but the, um, we are in the process of taking each program, part of the challenge is each program comes with their own funders um, that we establish in house. But taking those goals and um, aligning them with the agency's overall goals, we use their tools to do that. So with um, Head Start, as an example, with Head Start, um, they have a very rigid um, out list of outcomes. So we look for impact, um, kind of. I don't want to make it too complicated, but um, we use um, the measure, I, and I can give you the formal sheet that would make a lot more of, of sense than my babble, but <coughs> we've aligned our overall agency goals with um, the programmatic goals so that we can track them. All the funders now are looking for the same thing. They're looking for um, those outcome measures. So it's not the same with every program, but all of them have to be tracked. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I, I could share, you know, the um, individual. Uh, well, I just know it's always difficult to, mm -hmm. to quantify whether or not you're meeting some of these kind of broad goals for any. I mean, uh, obviously we haven't eliminated poverty, but it could be much worse if it wasn't for these programs, and it's really right. hard to and quantify. It really is, is to reduce poverty. So um, looking at the programs, um, like Head Start is an example that I can use because I'm a product of the Home County Head Start, you know. So <laughs> we, we look at not only what the kids um, have achieved, um, the measures for social development, and educational readiness that are a part of the Head Start program. But we're also looking at how we can go back in three years and partner with the elementary school to track where they are and what those major transitions for the first thing would be when they uh, take their first standardized test. So it's, it's not clear cut for each program, but those are some of the things we're attaching to it to get the impact that we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. And Rhonda and I, that's one thing that you and I talked about um, was continuing 
yeah. the measure into the elementary school to follow up and see how they were doing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I also had the opportunity to see your food truck. That was, <laughs> I don't think it's called the food truck. What do we call it's it? It's called the Mobile Fresh Pantry. Mobile mm -hmm. Fresh Pantry. It was beautiful. Very, Thank very, very we're very proud of it. Yeah. yeah. It was it's a, do a collaboration a between United Way, the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan, the Health Department, Ford Motor Company donated the unit. So it was definitely a combined effort by all parties to bring that dream to fruition. Oh, it's one more way that you know we coordinate and great things happen. It's excellent. Thank you so much for all that you do. It's it's very evident that your program is working, and we appreciate that. Um, I think Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rhonda and Dream Team, for your presentation. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, I actually learned quite a bit. I knew some of your programs, but not all of them. And um, I only have one question. Uh, you offer a variety of programs, Meals on Wheels, assistance for rent and mortgage and all that good stuff. Do If we have constituents that contact us that are having troubles, is do they just call the main line to you guys and you direct them, or are there different phone numbers for different services? How, how does that work? We can always direct people if they contact us through that main line, or they can go through our website. The more specific information is on the website, um, and certainly through our resource center. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Brown? Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Do you partner with uh, McCrest? I mean, not McCrest, uh, Samaritan House up on the north end? Yes, we actually distribute commodities um, through Samaritan House. How, how, how involved are you with them? How much? Well, we're pretty involved with all of our pantries because we do offer other supportive services. We do their um, pantry inspections to ensure that they're keeping the food safe because, of course, we want to make sure that they have the food safety guidelines because they are food distributing food. Mm -hmm. We also, um, they pick up from us on a monthly basis for their commodities. And basically, any other resources, we provide educational. Um, we do classes based on food safety and referrals and things of that nature. They refer to our action centers yeah, yeah. as well. As well. Mm -hmm. Do they require certifications that you help them with? The food safety piece. So yeah. I am food certified, so I physically go out to the pantries to ensure there's a, a basic checklist to ensure that you know the food has to be so many inches off the floor, so far away, if their cans are dented, all of those types of things. So, And then, of course, during the course of the year, if they have questions, they also have to go through a civil rights training mm -hmm. to ensure that they are meeting our civil rights requirements. Okay. That's very good. And, uh, I want it, Early in your presentation, you talked about the percentage of your budget and so forth, and the number that stuck out at me was a 7% administration cost, which is pretty good for most grant programs or 20% or, mm -hmm. or much higher than certainly 7%. And, uh, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you mentioned, but I want to call out Gary Cutler. He's been a steady hand at that agency yeah. for a long time. I don't know how many years you've been over there, Gary, but as long as I've been on the board, and we've never, that budget's always been good. It's always yeah. been tight. And mm -hmm. you have a lot of things going on over there that, that track and quantify, and it's got to be a complicated job. And uh, but I just want to say thank you again for on behalf of all of us for the, the work you do because that administration cost was higher. It's obviously less money going to the street where it's needed. So uh, we appreciate that and all the work of all your team for what you do to try to be the cost conscious as you can because uh, we need every dollar and uh, you see it, you see where it needs the most the families that are really in the hard up right now and uh, so we appreciate your work. Thank you, thank you very much and uh, thank you again, Gary, for your good work for us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No? Okay, we have a motion. Let's vote on your iPads. Okay, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> we have one more handout that would be helpful uh, for one of the resource centers that we just did um, the Thompson Center in Warren that just more information that'll help. Okay, thank you. Uh, the item is approved, it passed. Um, um, next, um, we have a motion to uh, forward an appointment from the director of, for the Director of Health and Community Services. Do you have a motion for that? And so move, Don Brown, do we have a, Support from Joe Romano and Mark Delden. Sir, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Chair Lucido, um, thank you. This is going to be a real easy one for me, and uh, what a wonderful segue um, into this next uh, topic that's before you. 
Um, as you know, uh, the charter requires that there are a number, a handful of uh, charter required positions uh, that um, require the confirmation of the Board of Commissioners. I enclosed in your packet is a, uh, a letter, and I'm here today on behalf of County Executive Mark Hackle, um, and he has uh, addressed a letter uh, to Board Chairman Smith um, requesting that um, be due to the retirement of Steve Gold uh, last week Friday that uh, we appoint um, no one better than Ms. Rhonda Powell, who you just heard from. And um, we're excited about this because um, uh, y you just uh, got a very appropriate overview of everything that goes on in MCA right now. And now to have uh, Ms. Powell in this position uh, with the commission's support, uh, she's able to uh, take her vision and her leadership team and continue to work with them to make an even greater impact on the County of Macomb um, for all the services that come under the, um, the Health and Community Services appointment. So with that, um, uh, for a woman who needs no introduction, um, Rhonda Powell, thank you. I'm back. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for your consideration. And I'll say that, you know, this is a huge honor for me to, uh, by the county executive, to fill such big shoes. Steve Gold will certainly be missed. He is a friend and mentor, and I have enjoyed every minute of um, trying to outdo one another with our sarcasm, so <laughs> so he will certainly be missed. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm excited at the opportunity to just kind of um, look at how we, the culture of service, really, in Macomb County and how we coordinate with uh, local organizations, how we, um, how we fare in the region and look at what other, um, some of you may know, I worked for the state of Michigan for a while as well um, as a deputy director for, at the time, it was the Office of C uh, S um, Services to the Aging. It's a new name now. Um, but um, I hope to bring some of, that, uh, some of that networking to Macomb County, continue to do that to see what type of pilots can we, um, you know, champion here in the county to um, to do better with coordination? And there's been a lot of talk of regionalization, and um, you know, and I'm not for or against. You know, I'm for us being at the table. If you know, if there are changes to be made, I believe that we want to be at that table. So, um, you know, like I said, the one of uh, the great accomplishments for me with community action. I'm, I'm extremely passionate about community action. Um, but I'm also passionate about the social determinants of health and uh, healthy communities and uh, the well-being of even our most vulnerable residents. Um, we have an aging county, and that's something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, I think the way that we treat our aging and our children it says a lot about who we are as a county, and this is the place where I grew up, where I raised my family, and uh, still have relatives all over the county. So, you know, it's I have a firsthand interest in making sure that what we do is state of the art. Thank you, Rhonda. And I know, as I mentioned, you and I have had the opportunity to speak, and mm -hmm. I've been very impressed with what you're doing and, and what's to come. Thank you. I know you do a great job. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Oh, we have a lot. <laughs> Here's some last <laughs> ones. Okay. Commissioner Smith. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Rhonda, um, though I'd rather not have heard about Steve's retirement and your right. appointment through the Macomb Daily, uh, I. <laughs> Sorry. You stood me I up. Am, I am stood very, me up uh, for lunch. I am, <laughs> I am, I am very uh, uh, happy about the choice. I think they've made a wise choice. We've known each other for many, many years, and I, I think that you're going to do a great job there and look forward to uh, working with you, presumptively uh, working with you after yeah. this vote um, <laughs> in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Toko? Thank you. Congratulations, Rhonda. Thank you. What does this do to your position now? I mean, that creates a vacancy mm -hmm. in your position. Yes. Uh, so what? one of my priorities will be to try to uh, find a replacement and, um, you know, uh, work with our HR to um, get someone else in and, um, you know, get a 
get a viable list of candidates that we can interview to fill that position. But I really plan to ensure we've done so much work in community action and it, it, we really have to make sure we maintain that momentum. It's extremely important. Yes. So you'll step up right away into Steve's position or will your position be filled first? Um, well, uh, presumptively, um, after the full board confirmation, then I really would um, be in a dual role and um, would work with um, the executive's office to kind of um, bridge both of those. Um, but I would continue to support Macomb Community Action in, the, uh, in this capacity until a replacement is found. Okay, that was my question. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the same lines, uh, you and I were just discussing an issue that I need to follow up with mm -hmm. you. And um, I have a phone number in front of me, but I don't know if that phone number is gonna be good and for how long it's gonna be good to get a hold of you. You'll be able to reach me because um, we Wonder Woman works for us who's here, Karen, <laughs> and she'll make sure to, that uh, even if I'm not at that office. But I, I plan to be in the same, at the same desk for a while. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's all. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you. Thank and we you. look forward to what's to come. Thank you very, very much. Good. Um, we have a motion, so let's vote on our iPads, please. And thank you, um, Deputy County Executive Zeldin. Thank you. Motion's passed. Thank you. Um, our next item on our agenda is um, item 7B. And we need a motion to um, forward to finance the Medical Reserve Corps mini grant. Commissioner Brown and Commissioner Romano. It will go on to finance. I'm sorry, I got out and I got back in. Yes. Um, Director of Finance, Steve Smigel, would you like to, do you have anything to add? Um, Krista Willett from the uh, Health Department is here to speak more about this particular item. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Krista Willett. I'm the Deputy Health Officer at the Health Department. And um, I am just here seeking approval of the amendment to accept the $6,000 grant. And this mini grant will allow us to expand our capacity to receive volunteers in the event of a public health emergency. Okay. Any questions? Do we have any more questions? Okay, okay thank, thank you. Thank you. Let's vote on our iPads. Motion passes unanimously. Um, agenda item 7C. Um, we have a motion to forward to finance the Children's Services Grant. Move. Commissioner Romano. Support. Supported by Myjack. Commissioner Myjack. Um, Mr. S Michael, Steve Smigel, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Come on Very up. similar comment. So Gary Cutler from Community Action will talk about the next three items. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, this award here for the $239,000 that can be found on page 28 of your packet is just additional funds that is coming in for our Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Award. Um, you'll see the, the new award on page 30 and the previous award on page 32 the difference between what we were originally awarded for this fiscal year and our current award is the $239,693. So we're just asking that, um, that the board approve the increase of our budget and the amount of expenditures and revenues equally. Okay. Um, can you remind me that and put them all together? Or should I just carry on? All right, we have a motion to forward that to finance. Please vote. Okay. 
keep going? Okay. All right. Um, motion passes. Um, can we have a motion to forward to finance Macomb Act Community Action Budget Amendment? Commissioner Romano? Aye. Support from Commissioner Leonetti? Um, Mr. Smigel, do you have anything you'd like to add? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it says no. Okay, yeah. sorry. Gary will do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, what we're requesting here was the county in, the, in our fiscal year. So um, Macomb Community Action has uh, the bulk of our programs, our fiscal year programs, which started um, generally in October. Some of our programs start a little before that. Um, but for the programs that started in this budget year and our fiscal year, we had budgeted a 2% general increase for county employees. Um, the HR department negotiated a lump sum payment and a 1% pay, which was approved by this Board of Commissioners. The difference in that budget is the $288,000. So we are asking that the Board of Commissioners approves a allocation from general fund of an additional $288,510 to make up the difference between the amount of money that was paid in the lump sum and 1% of pay of our employees. Again, we budgeted based on the county's recommendation a 2% increase in people's pay. The people got a one, our staff, including myself, got a 1% pay plus lump sums. And you'll see the calculations in your worksheet, but that's what this request is for. Are there any questions, commissioners? Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I apologize. Go through that one more time. The difference. Okay. You budgeted for the one percent. We we budgeted for two percent. The county gave employees lump sum payments and one percent. So the difference that I did here, um, and you'll see the calculation on page thirty-six of your sheet. I took the, the lump sum that was paid to our employees and the variable fringes that went with that and also took what a 1% pay increase was for our staff and the difference between those two e is what equals the $288,000 for Macomb Community Action staff. Thank you, Madam Chair, if I can continue. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Grant funds for administrative is a large portion of that, correct? Correct. So you're saying out of the general fund tax dollars, I, I can't, I didn't find that page, but. 55. 55. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I guess my question is, what difference is made up with the actual, not general fund dollars, but your either federal or state grant dollars or matching fund dollars that covers that 288? Um, our, the, the budgets that I submitted to all of our grant funders included a 2% pay increase. So if we do not get this money from the board, we will be ha we'll have to reduce services by $288,510 across the board. I apologize, let me, let me rephrase okay. that. Um, the way I understand, you get X amount of dollars for a grant, and then mm -hmm. you're allowed to take administratively to pay for an employee to do that work, correct? Yes. With that raise of that employee, 1% plus the bonus, um, that doesn't cover the difference, or why would it come out of the general fund? And I understand certain positions that are general fund 100% solely funded, but is this, you're saying, across your, the entire thing? Well, some of those positions are grant funded, are they not? Yes, most of our positions are grant funded. The, the, this is, if, if those grants pay for this additional benefit or pay that the employees got, the reduction of services to the clients of Macomb County will be reduced dollar for dollar. I, okay, so what you're saying is that you're not gonna take it from the grant, you're gonna take it out of the general fund instead of taking it from the grant. 
Right. Somebody needs to help explain this to me. I Th this is an ad the the grant. Okay. Let's let's just make it simple that I'm the only employee in the grant. Yes, sir. Instead of getting a two percent pay raise, I got a one percent pay raise plus twenty one hundred dollars. That twenty one hundred dollars exceeds one percent of my pay. So if the grant was designed to pay for me for a whole year, it would be two thousand dollars short of having the money to pay for my services for the full year. Then one percent, because they are getting the one percent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you. Um, just regarding that very quickly. Is during the budget process, um, was that something that was just missed in the calculations going in? No, the, the contracts were not settled until okay, subsequent to the budget. Okay, that's what I was wondering was so the timing of it. We anticipated this happening, though, because... Because it didn't happen in every single department, so it was just a, an correct, oversight or a mist right. in this particular Ex area. Well, and because the... Because community actions year end starts on October 1st. These payments were made in okay. December. So we anticipated this. And if you remember, there were short term additional costs to providing those lump sum payments. But the long term, the long range impact of that lump sum payment versus across the board increases in each of the three years of the contract. I forgot the exact number, but it was a very significant amount of savings for the county. Right, right, and I knew that. I just was wondering right. the timing of the vote and if that's what affected right. this. Yeah. And and I'm, and I don't know why it didn't affect all departments equally, but um, I figured the timing had something to do with it. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Smith. Thanks. So I, I just want to understand this right, and this is kind of for Commissioner Carabelli. So you were let's just say you're the only employee and you were slated to get a 2% raise and that was going to be $2,000. But instead you only got a 1% raise plus a lump sum. So you got $1,000, but the lump sum was maybe like 1400 So you actually, we're actually having to pay you more than we would have with the 2% raise, right? So Correct. We're, we're, we're behind. And then this is, uh, this is budgeted for, I mean, is this something that's, how, how does this affect our, the general fund, Steve? That's, that's my only question. I'm <laughs> sorry, we're, we're a little behind uh, on the. Uh, this will draw down on the fund balance of for mm -hmm. 288,000 in 2017. Mm -hmm. But again, long term. No, I understand that. So. I just didn't know, but we did not. It, this isn't. This we didn't something. budget for it because we weren't sure where the contracts were right. going to land. Okay. And that being said, they probably landed this way because it did, even though it affected the budget this year. Correct. It was going to affect it in a positive way down the line. Right, exactly. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments for our first round? Second round, Commissioner Thank Carabelli. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Steve, would you come up again for a minute. And this uh, this contract uh, with these races was a how many year? A three year contract, one percent, one percent, one percent. Okay. Um, so going forward, we shouldn't have a problem with these next three years of any adjustments. Or this was a one time deal. With the one time, yeah, we have another lump sum payment in. 17 at the end of this year for a thousand dollars as opposed to 2100 last year and then zero lump sum in 2019 but again we were projecting uh two percent across the board for 17 one and a half every year going forward so so this budget adjustment right now is for which year 2017 okay then you just said there was another one at the end of 17 we will have a thousand dollar lump sum payment in December of 17, which we, which from a community action will affect their 2018 budget. So we'll build that in this budget cycle. So you'll be all set in the next Exactly. Year. And we already built that into the, the general fund because it's the, a December year end. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? From commissioners? No? Okay. We have a motion. Let's vote on our iPads. Motion passes. 
Um, we have a motion to forward to finance the community service grant. And um, Mr. Cutler, would you like to explain that? Okay. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to get my motion first. Do we have a motion? Commissioner Kraft? Support. Support. Commissioner Toko? Thank you. Thank you. So what I've done is I, I as I brought forth your budgets, this, this budget is for community services. And within com community services, um, we have um, four different programs here. As Rhonda mentioned, we were able to get um, United Way to start giving us money. So there's two grants in here uh, that are new grants to us. Uh, one is for 100000 and one is for $70,000 for this fiscal year. And um, the Consumers Energy, they increased the amount of money they awarded to us. That's um, the third increase. And we also had our SSVF program, which was discontinued. Um, we are a subrecipient through Community Action Partnership in Washington, D.C. They had six subrecipients. All six subrecipients were not funded into this current fiscal year. So we are removing um, that budgeted line item, and along with that program, we have added three other programs. So it's a, it's a net reduction of our budget of just under two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Are there any questions? I see no questions. Um, let's vote on our iPads. Motion passes. Um, we need a motion to approve or to um, combine 7F, G, and H, which so moved. There's a motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Brown and Commissioner. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Romano. I'm sorry. That's okay. I thought you were talking to me. Um, right, I know, I just, so we've combined F, G, and H. Um, Michael Hudson from Animal Control is here. I'm going to introduce the topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, once again. So um, before you all start with the uh, City of East Point, uh, contained in your packet is uh, the county's standard um, boilerplate um, agreement for Macomb County Animal Control Services. These are the same agreements that we bring to the board annually uh, for um, their animal control division or workers to use our shelter and their specified fees listed in here. So uh, this is what's considered an intergovernmental agreement and by charter it must come before the uh, Board of Commissioners for approval. It has already been approved and signed by City Manager uh, of East Point and forwarded to my attention, which uh, we sent to yours. So I'll start with that one. If there's any questions, be happy to uh, be happy to answer in any of them. Otherwise, I'll move on to the city of Roseville. Do we have any questions, Commissioner Carabelli? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the. Uh, I apologize. No questions on this one. No questions. No. Okay. How about? Um, 7G on the Rose Roseville Animal Control Service. So City of Roseville, uh, what you have here is um, uh, the City of Roseville have, has asked the Macomb County Animal Control um, Division to take over their entire operation. So it's my understanding they, for several years now, they've employed one full-time animal control worker and now they want us to take care of that for them. Uh, we did this uh, just recently, maybe three years ago in the City of St. Clair Shores. Uh, where we took over their animal control services uh, in its entirety. Uh, we have reached agreement. The agreement before you tonight is, looks uh, quite a bit different uh, than the one for East Point. East Point just wants services. Uh, City of Roseville wants us to take over their entire operation. Uh, there is a corresponding budget amendment, and uh, if you want um, um, explanation on that, uh, Steve Smeagle can do that for you. 
Uh, but uh, we're real, real excited, and uh, they're extremely excited to, uh, to work with us. And the model out in St. Clair Shores has worked extremely well. And um, we have, uh, we have uh, fine-tuned these agreements. And, you know, we said a couple of years ago that as more communities uh, possibly want us to take over their animal control services, um, uh, we're probably going to get some uh, economies of scale and we'll get more efficient um, as we go. But just to note, um, East Detroit did not ask us to take over their entire um, animal control uh, division, just they want to use our shelter for services. So. Uh, with that, um, I'll open it up to any questions relative to the agreements or the arrangement, the money. Hit, them, hit any of them. Right, Commissioner To a Seinfeld? point of order, I mean, I think there was a motion in support to combine everything, and mm -hmm. I don't think there was ever a, a motion vote. Motion to forward? No, no, there was a motion to combine all yeah. three items. Mm -hmm. And once that motion took place, number one, I didn't know which button to press because I don't know what's on your screen. Okay. And number two, that motion never passed. So uh, as we sit here, there's either three separate votes or we need to cast that first motion. And then once we cast that, mm -hmm. then I would assume we would request to speak on the East Point one with re without regard to whichever one we want to speak on. Does that make sense to everybody? Madam Chair, being that this motion is on the floor to combine all three, I think it's it is appropriate to go ahead and discuss all three because you're not taking a vote as of yet. So you're open for discussion, and during that discussion, all three things can be discussed. And if you object to that, you can vote no on that motion, and the motion is either pass or fail. But, but yeah. don't we have to first actually vote to combine them? Just cast the vote to combine them. Once we've done that, then we then we know we'll just use the East Point one to request to speak. There's a motion. Point of order. She was she's yeah. right. Actually, we should should even combine them all. They should all be taken separately. To be honest with you, that's probably the best way to do it. Okay. I, I kind of thought, but you know, so let's just take them individually and be done. We heard the presentation. Just go one through one at a time. Okay. Because so do we? Because they're each separate subject. They probably should, technically shouldn't have been he's combined to begin with. He, but he made the motion right. He's rescinding. All right. Do I have anyone that would like to withdraw the motion I do. to combine them? Okay. Commissioner Brown, second and five. Commissioner Romano. I thought they were all so the same. So we'll go part, back and vote. Subject. Thank you. We'll go back and take a motion for the F East Point Animal Control, which is seven F. Motion to forward that to finance. Motion by um, Commissioner Leonetti, seconded by Drolette. Let's, we've already discussed it. Do you have another question on East Point? Okay, Commissioner, sorry, Carabelli first. What's, what's that dated? Yeah, it's it's a moot it's a moot point and it's a moot point, and I prefer not to even uh, discuss it. Yes, it's a moot point. Okay, any other questions, Commissioner Drolet? Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess uh, I just wanted to, the briefest of backgrounds on this. Have we provided these services in uh, this city or? Looking forward to the next most in Roseville in the past in some capacity? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I can just give you kind of like a high level overview of what yeah. happened. So, about three years ago, um, under the new direction of the um, Animal Control uh, Division here in the county, uh, we changed some of our policies and we were applying for grants. But grants said that we had to comply with certain types of initiatives like TNR programs, which is trap, neuter, and return, and other things. So, we were going after lots of money, and I, I will say that in the last four years, uh, uh, this county has been recipi recipients of well over half a million dollars in grant uh, to provide training and enhancements. Um, some of the communities, there were four communities uh, in the county that said, we don't want your services anymore because we don't want to comply with your new policies. We don't want our cats back in our neighborhood after they're trapped and neutered and returned. And besides, we can get it done cheaper somewhere else. So there were four, four communities, um, one of which was East Point, that sent us a letter and developed their own coalition and said, we're gonna go somewhere else, and that was fine with us. Um, one by one, uh, for whatever reasons um, that really aren't any of our concern, they wanted to come back. They, and, and, but, but 
we wouldn't bring them back until their city council had passed a resolution, you know, buying into our policies. Um, so one by one, they've come back. Now, East Point is the last of the four communities uh, that are coming back utilizing our animal control shelter. That's very helpful. I yeah. sort of came and was elected in the middle of it and didn't yeah. understand some of the people coming up to right. speak on it. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, Commissioner Toko? Thank you. Um, the TNR program's not been changed, has it? Michael? No. Okay, so that remains intact. They're going to adopt to the county policy? Yes. Okay. And is the Roseville contract identical to the St. Clair Shores contract? Um, I, 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 I don't know if it is or not. Michael, can you? Uh, can you? Um, we added in more costs to cover um, kennel attendant services. The St. Clair Shores, con Shores contract is more just for the officer and the truck for their area. Because of the increased capacity for more animals coming in, we've added some dollars to bring in a kennel attendant to handle more animals in the building as well. So it's a little bit larger, um, but they agreed to it. And will those will those costs be shared then between both communities, Roseville and St. Clair Shores? Or is it just now because we're adding another one, it's time to add another? It's, uh, it's the second. So in St. Clair Shores, it's set up for five years to start at the end of 2015. So that might be a change as we move forward with the next contract with them. Okay. So yeah. It's all Roseville for this one. Okay, and then I noticed the contract was dated in April. Has, have our services already started in? Nope, it's for starting July 1st. Um, we've made ourselves available for any kind of emergencies because they're kind of in between um, right now, but it's for July 1st. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, we have a motion to forward to finance. Can we take a vote? East Point, yes. Motion passes. Um, we need a motion to separately forward the um, to finance the Roseville Animal Control Services. So moved. Uh, so moved. <laughs> Toko and Leonetti, Commissioners Toko and Leonetti. Um, I'm sorry. All set. You already spoke on Roseville, so can we? Is that, does anyone have any additional questions on Roseville, Commissioner Kleinfeld? That's okay. Um, thank you. Just very briefly. Okay, so the um, the first one is is the actual contract, and then the second one is the budget amendment following it. Correct. So the first one, it's got um, an amount of twenty eight thousand in revenue for licensing in the city, and the second one is fourteen. Is that because it's for half a year? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the licensing, will that actually take place within the city of Roseville or will that take place um, through Macomb County? Okay, so the contract refers to um, on number six, uh, uh, where it says, therefore it is agreed upon number six, refers to um, exhibit A with regard to payments. Is the budget paper that you gave um, that's two pages later, is that Exhibit A? Or do, that is Exhibit A, so that would be the exhibit that the that Roseville received. Okay, so I, just looking at that out of curiosity, um, I was having a hard time reading it. Um, why does the, uh, why are the 2017 totals um, n not changing significantly to add those to add positions or um, I'm I'm not seeing a change in a, like in uh, like vehicle didn't change. Is this all just? It can't just all be Roseville because it's got like 579 thousand for 2018 in salary. So that's not just Roseville. Do you right, understand? So what we're doing is we're allocating. So we're gonna have we have to add one animal control officer, which will bring the total to seven. We're allocating one seventh of the cost, the total cost of an animal control officer, including benefits, to uh, the contract, which is seventy-three thousand five hundred twenty-four. We have to add one animal or kennel attendant. So we're 
allocating the total cost of all kennel attendance to the city based on their percentage of total intakes for the year. Okay, so we don't have broken <coughs> down in this document those, what you're adding, right? So we, so the 297 that we have for animal control, that's for all the animal control, that's not just for Roseville's portion, correct? Right, Roseville's portion is 73,524. And Way down at the bottom. Okay. Because <coughs> we're, al we're adding up the total cost and then allocating their proportionate share. Okay, I got it. Yep. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay. Any further questions on the Roseville Amendment? Okay, we can take a vote on that. Motion passes. We need a, well it worked, <laughs> at least once. Okay, it worked. We need a motion to forward to finance um, the budget amendment for animal control. Motion made by Commissioner Toko, support, supported by Commissioner Smith. Any discussion on this? Any questions? Commissioner Drolette? No. Okay, I have a couple other people up here. Does anyone have any questions? No? I think this is from the last one. Okay, let's take a vote. And that passes. Uh, agenda item number eight, we have a resolution urging the funding and um, preservation of public oversight and delivery of community mental health services. Um, Chair Bob Smith, we need a motion to forward it to full board. Motion made by um, Romano and supported by Toko. Do you have a, any questions? Just a quick comment, obviously I support this, but um, and I've said in the past, I believe when we do a resolution that's two or more pages, nobody's reading it, that we would be better off condensing our resolutions to one page and really focusing on what, what our position is and what we want to say instead of giving two pages of background, because I think they actually might read them if they were shorter, and I don't think they will, but uh, obviously I support it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Toko? Thank you. Where is this being forwarded to? Forwarded to full board. But after it goes here, are we sending it on to our legislators or, I mean, I know that there are a bunch of, of um, in the last paragraph, right. it states, where, but what prompted this at this time or who requested that we do this? Who the help was going to for the time? CMH, okay. Community Mental Health. Thank you. Okay, can we have a vote? Well, well, quick question. No, I'm sorry. Commissioner Drollet? Just by clarification, so this resolution would urge both the funding and the preservation of both the public oversight and public delivery. So all, like all four things, the, uh, the funding and preservation, or three things, the funding and the preservation of government oversight and government oversight of the delivery of these services, is that correct? Those three items? Chair? So, so this resolution would urge essentially three things. Uh, both the uh, preservation of the funding mm -hmm. as one thing, then the preservation of government oversight uh, of, the, of the, the situation, or I guess the services, and then also government delivery of the services. So we're encouraging uh, the government to deliver these services in addition to the oversight of the services and, and the funding of the service, correct? Yes, okay. Basically what we're urging is for the system to stay in place pretty much as is, um, based on you know, the success we've been having and based on uh, you know, a work group that they actually commissioned to put together to look into this and the funding and the work group came back to them and said, 
it is working the way it should work. The new way is, uh, we've already seen examples that, uh, that the privatization of this um, kind of leaves a lot more people go through, slip through the cracks. So in general, we're recommending, which uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld and Commissioner Carabelli, that we will probably uh, amend this to tighten it up a little bit here, that's for sure. Uh, but it will, in essence, yes, urge those three things. Thank you. Okay, do we have a vote? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Carabelli? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote yes on this right now to move it to full board, full board. to keep the process going. Mm -hmm. But um, like I had mentioned, this thing is way too long, and as I go through it, I get a little confused, and I, as you all know, I confuse very easily. You do. So I'd like to see a condensed version <laughs> prior to the full board to see if I can vote for it at that time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Sure, Commissioner Leonetti. Thank you, Madam Chair. It goes along with Commissioner Tocos. Uh, is there any sense of urgency in getting this out? Because our full board meeting is next week. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, the powers that be that we send this to, should we get this out sooner than next week? I guess Kraft? I can speak to that. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. Um, it's budget season right now at the Capitol, and it looks like it'll be mid to end, end of June when they finalize it, if all goes well. Um, I know that they are working on CMH from both sides, the Senate and the House, they both have different ideas. Um, some, I think the Senate side has multiple pilot programs and the House has one or vice versa, but uh, we're working on different options. So I, I guess the urgency of this would be to have it done by the next full board meeting and get it out because the budget talks are happening now, work groups are happening now. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I would urge that we, if we're gonna do a condensed version or three different versions of it, that we do it quickly and get it out to us so that by next week, going along with what Commissioner Kraft says, we get it over to the powers that be Absolutely. promptly. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Agreed, thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Brown? You know, I agree generally about this. Shorter and brief is better. However, that resolution contains a lot of information that Maybe the, maybe the legislators don't have the time to read it, but their staffs will, and they'll look at that information. There's a lot of policy things there that make a difference, that matter about the issue they're discussing. Now, they may not have the time to read it, but their staffs probably will take a look at that. It's important to include the reasons why we've got an argument to be made. And there are many good points in that, those whereases, though there are many of them, certainly uh, add to the case of support our position. So I, um, in this case, I don't think that we should be sh cutting out too many of those because they're relevant to what we're talking about. And uh, so that's my two cents. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, may we have a vote? Okay. Um, may we combine the course? Oh, I'm sorry. Motion passes. It's gone. Um, okay. Okay. Can um, we need a motion to receive and file our correspondence? Can we do that in its entirety? Okay. Thank you. Motion made by uh, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Support. Commissioner Romano. Let's vote. Any questions? Yeah. Motion passes. Um, agenda item number 10, new business. Any new business from commissioners? Commissioner, I'm sorry, Chair Smith? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a quick note that uh, the jail study is going to be on Thursday's presentation so I just want to urge all of you to plan for uh, maybe a little longer meeting than normal that's it okay thank you and that's our new business we don't need a vote for that do we no okay any public participation we have a packed house out there <laughs> seeing none um, we need a motion to adjourn so moved, Commissioner R Romano. Support by Commissioner Drolet. Thank you.
Oh, I'm sorry, we need a vote. All in favor? <laughs> All in favor. Can we do, do a voice vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. No. I know, there's a lot.